Welcome to Our College, Your Voices. I'm your host, Kara Monroe. This is the first in a special series of thought leader interviews. This special series of interviews is designed to help prepare college leadership for a future visioning activity taking place in summer 2021. We are adding all of the interviews where the participants have allowed it for our entire college community to hear. In this episode, futurist Alexandra Whittington discusses the role of a futurist and some of her ideas for the future. I loved this conversation, and I'm so excited to work with Alexandra through our series of upcoming leadership events. Personally, I'm off to research biophilic design after I re-listen to this episode. Please introduce yourself, your organization, institution, or agency, and your role. Hi, Kara. Well, I'm Alex Whittington, and I am a futurist. And I, like a lot of people, actually have sort of a dual role. I do run my own futurist consulting business, which is called Partners in Foresight. And I've been doing that for several years. Uh, And I've also been teaching for several years. Actually, I think I just marked 11 years as an adjunct uh, lecturer at the University of Houston, where I teach classes about the future. How do you become a futurist? You know, there are many ways to become a futurist. I happen to have one of the most unusual paths, even though it sounds like the most normal path to a career. I'm one of the only people I know that has taken this path. I literally took an undergraduate course at the University of Houston when I was an anthropology major called Studies of the Future. It was an elective. It was a random one-time thing. One of my anthropology professors had attended the World Future Society Conference, which is a huge event every summer. It it doesn't go on anymore, but it had been around since like the 60s. And it was a huge conference. She went and she thought, oh my gosh, this is fascinating as an anthropologist, you know, the whole human adaptation to our future and stuff. So we, she did a course, I signed up for the course and I just kind of loved it. And I was fortunate enough in that course to meet Dr. Bishop, who ran the Future Studies Master's degree program at the University of Houston, which, I mean, this was not pre-planned. I had no idea, but uh, it just all worked out. So when I finished my anthropology degree, I went right to grad school for studies of the future. So I have a master's degree in that from the University of Houston, at where that master's degree program is still going. It's called Foresight. Now, they, the terminology changes, and this is something I'll address more in depth as we get sure. to know each other, but um, I am a futurist by training. So a lot of people okay. kind of have a profession. They are like, oh, that futurist thing looks cool. And they read some books or take a certifi- certif- mm-hmm. certificate course or something. But I actually have the whole academic route down. And then I'm fortunate okay. enough to now, um, I, when I started teaching, I actually taught that first undergrad course that my anthropology teacher taught at the University of Houston. They oh, asked I love me to that. bring it back. So it was a really, yeah, it's a really cool, like full circle type experience. That's awesome. I took one featuring course as a part of my doctoral studies and I loved it, but I had no idea you could have a career as a futurist until we started working with you. So I'm, I'm just really, I'm very curious and I'm very excited to learn more from you. How are you working with Ivy Tech as we plan for our community college of the future retreat? Well, I'm thrilled to be working with you guys. This is a very exciting project for me. And I wanted to put it out there on this interview as sort of an exciting luxury meal. Okay. I want to put it to you this way. We have four courses starting with the appetizer next Wednesday, or I'll just say May 5th. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to give a presentation at one of the meetings that will sort of lay out the idea of what is a futurist, elaborating on what I just told you, how a futurist thinks, how that we approach strategy, what we're thinking about 2030. So I'm going to start a sort of start getting people's appetite going with an appetizer, right? And then uh, next after that, I'm going to bring on the healthy part. This is the education piece. I feel really lucky to get to work with these groups and teach them basically in a very hands-on, very fun, interactive workshop, how to think more like a futurist. I'm going to prepare uh, some activities, a little bit of lecture, not too much, but just sort of teach kind of like I would teach my students how to be a futurist. From there, that was the good stuff, right? You get your vitamins and your nutrition from your salad and everything. We're going to move on to the main course, which is the actual group work. I'm going to get to work with the groups individually as teams and kind of just coach them through this strategic thinking process. Once they've been exposed to the futurist motivations and ideas and some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about in terms of trends and issues, we're going to, I'm going to support them. I just really want to coach these groups to come up with the best ideas they can, prepare their presentations for dessert, which is the retreat. We're, I'm really looking forward to that too. I bet everyone is. We're going to get to meet in person, do a hands-on activity, really 
hardcore futurist stuff. Like I'm going to push them to the limit to come up with awesome. tangible evidence of what the future of what 2030 and beyond even looks like for the community college. That is so exciting. I, I loved that analogy of the meal to the activity. And I can already tell I'm going to be uh, one of your most excited students in this. So I'm very excited awesome. about it. We're asking all of our thought leaders some questions. So I'd love for our audience to hear from you on these next few questions. So what big trends are you seeing for the future that you think we should be mindful of at Ivy Tech? And then I'll ask you to extend that to all of higher education. This is a great question. And this is something I've been studying a lot lately. I have a couple of ideas. I just want to throw them out there. That's what futurists yeah. do. We sort right. of present fringe edgy ideas to see how people respond, not just because we want to get a rise out of people, but because we typically are very attuned to really new stuff that not everyone has heard of. Here, I'll start with sort of a more out there one. I'm obsessed with biophilia. Biophilia Ooh. is the love of nature, right? The okay. biophilic design is a yeah. very big design trend. And I'm sure you've noticed it. Mm -hmm. It's all about having indoor plants, greenery, open air spaces, natural light, clean internal environments. And all of that is meant to, well, it's not just meant to, but it's scientifically proven to improve people's mood, people's well-being, outlook, health, and most importantly, learning. Right. So green living environments, I think that that's an interesting trend to look at, not just in terms of the design sense, but how do you plug in the love of nature into your spaces and your courses even? Um, it may right. be, I think it's an up and coming area for Gen Z. Mm -hmm. They're really obsessed with sustainability. Right. They're really, of course, I mean, this is their future, right? So right. They, to ensure that their planet is habitable when they're older, they're very attuned to nature and natural processes. I think even other trends like um, plant-based meat, mm -hmm. you know, the plant-based mm -hmm. burgers and stuff. Yep. I think the that impossible burgers. That. Yeah. yeah. I'm kind of, I'm all about food today. I don't know uh -huh. <laughs> but, you know, eating, you know, plant-based diet, that's a, a biophilic move, right? It shows that you care about the planet, you care about nature. So mm -hmm. a lot of our activities, recycling, the decisions we make about the stuff we buy in our home, clothing, you know, people are very interested in Showing respect to nature, I think, mm -hmm. in our planet. I think that's an emerging yeah. idea. Another one I wanted to mention is surveillance capitalism. This, this is the title of a book. Can't recall the author's name off the top of my head, but it's a well-known book. But it's an ongoing trend that's been around probably since social media started rising. Mm -hmm. And what it refers to is basically the social media business model, mm -hmm. which makes money off of our data right? Yep. They're observing us. They're collecting information about us. We aren't hundred percent sure what they know or what they're mm -hmm. doing with it, but that's how they make money, right? Facebook is free for a reason, right? Because we're the product. Precisely. Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of uh, education and, and uh, colleges and students, I think this is something we need to be super aware of because it's not just the Facebooks of the world monitoring people's activities. It's also some of our testing stuff. And I say this as someone in education, you know, some of the computerized learning programs that we use, the apps, the different things that students love to use as tools, you know, whether it's creating citations online or the, the texting apps and stuff that they use, all of those things are monitoring people's behavior yep. and monetizing it. Yep. So I, I, my experience has been that students, young students, 19, 20, are not 100% clear on this. Mm -hmm. I have had several students in class, because we talk about this, obviously, in my courses, who are, are like, you know, I've heard that. I've heard that Twitter, like, keeps track of all my mm -hmm. whereabouts and all that. But is that really true? And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that actually is true. Yeah. That's how they make money. We don't pay to use Twitter. We don't pay to right. use Facebook. They make money off of our behavior patterns. Yeah. So I think that, you know, anyone working with young people or any, any person, any age, mm -hmm. really older people are probably extremely vulnerable. We know right. kids are really at risk um, of being exploited online, even through their games and stuff. Raising awareness around surveillance capitalism in the uh, college setting could be a really mm -hmm. important trend. I, I have a I have a phrase I use with friends all the time that the internet is always listening because I have several Alexa devices in my house and it is not at all unusual to have a conversation with someone about something and the next time I'm on the internet all I see are ads about that thing you know to the you, I think you're talking about it from a much more genteel idea of teaching and educating people but how do we use that as a marketing tool? How do we use that at Ivy Tech as a way to understand that people are having a conversation about, I want to become a nurse or I want to become a welder. 
and how do we make sure that that we get those ads to them? So yeah. technology can be used for good and for evil. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I think, you know, looking at these trends in terms of how to use them for mm-hmm. good is the, the right. humanizing approach to the right. future. Absolutely. So what is an interesting trend that you have discovered that you think will change the way we work? This is a really far out one, but I'm just amazed with this trend. I'm not sure if you've heard of neurotech. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this is neuro- neurological technology, mm-hmm. and um, Elon Musk has a company called Neuralink. That's yep. how a lot of people have related to this concept. Yep. And they recently tested a, a implant, a bra- brain implant chip on a monkey. Mm-hmm. I think it was a monkey, some kind of primate, uh, to play a video game with its mind. So the monkey was implanted with the device. They somehow, you know, had it hooked up to the video game and he just sat there and made the thing move by thinking about it. And there, you know, is a lot of activity around making this accessible for humans, for video games, for controlling, you know, your phone, maybe talking Mm -hmm. to your Alexa. It's kind of a form of brain hacking. You know, it's the kind of technology that was invented for therapeutic purposes, right? The good, Mm -hmm. the good stuff, right? Right. Helping people learn to walk again, you know, victims of paralysis, different brain injuries or whatever. But now they're finding that they can use it to help people lose a phobia, right? Learn how to overcome a fear, learn how to handle, you know, ADHD or something like that. There's actually earbuds on the market now that don't involve any sort of clip. They don't involve any sort of, I mean, chip or implant. It's totally external, but um, earbuds that you wear to help you fall asleep. It works Mm -hmm. with your brain waves. There's also some earbuds that can diagnose anxiety. It's in your, they're in your ears. They pick Mm -hmm. up on these subtle facial motions that we don't even know about. Mm -hmm. It's just a person is dealing with anxiety. Oh, interesting. So I think that is going to change the way we work. I mean, whether it is, you know, typing just by thinking the words, right? So when you answer an email, you just think, uh, yeah, I can be there at two. And that person gets that message. Or if it's something more advanced, like hacking our minds to be more productive, to be better students, uh, to get a promotion, right? Maybe if I upgrade my brain a little, my right. boss will give me that pay raise. Oh, that is, these are conversations I love. I could talk with you all day. <laughs> I know they scare a lot of people, but for me, it's just like, this is, this is how inventions happen. This is how you create new things is through thinking about it and just trying to take one step towards it. So In what ways do you think the future of work will look different in five to 10 years? I'm going to push for the 10-year time horizon as a futurist. And I'm going to say that in 10 years, I think it's really possible that work will be separate from earning a living. For a very long time, your job, your work has been your sustenance, the way that you get the stuff that you need. But I think there's a couple of important trends out there that are possibly changing that. One of them we've heard a lot about, automation right? Mm -hmm. Robots are going to take our jobs. We're going to automate away a number of roles and people won't have to do anything. We can just sort of hang out and let robots do everything for us and sort of enjoy that abundance. Let's say that the, that AI and robotics will create profits that we can all sort of draw from, or that a company Mm -hmm. can be successful from, and we won't have to put forth any effort. And that's sort of a utopian sci-fi idea that goes back. Um, But I think once you couple that with something called universal basic income, Mm -hmm. UBI, something that, Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, last night, uh, state of the union address, Mm -hmm. the first, one of the first things Biden mentioned was the cash stimulus payments to Americans. And that's what universal basic income is. It's direct cash payments to citizens, let's say people Mm -hmm. either by their government. Sometimes these pilots are run by like a nonprofit. It can be even private money going in to provide a base income for people Mm -hmm. so that anything they earn over that is just extra. And the idea is that it enables people to pursue their passion. Right. right? I mean, I, maybe I want to be an artist, but we all know it's really Mm -hmm. hard to make money as an artist. So if I had the basic income to just let me live, I could afford rent, not a lavish lifestyle, but something minimal. And then, you know, when you sell an art piece or you can take art classes or somehow, you know, invest in what you want to be doing, not Mm -hmm. so much what you have to do to survive, but what really gives your life a purpose. So I think that's one of the biggest changes. One of the biggest differences we'll see will be that work will not be what you have to do. It'll be what you want to do. And you may or may not make money from it. Things like digital currency, right? Mm -hmm. Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. 
people are making money on Bitcoin doing absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, you know, there's other currencies too that you can literally mine these NFTs. Every time someone plays one, you, you get a royalty or whatever. So we may be earning our money in very unexpected ways. And so we won't need to have a job. We'll have some form of sustenance coming in, whether it's US dollars or not, I don't know, but it could be some other currency. It could just be something that I can use or trade for other stuff. Another factor that I was going to mention was this sort of like self-sustaining concept that people are really going mm-hmm. for after the pandemic, that my home can be self-sustaining. Like my, I could be off grid, you mm-hmm. know, the power wall, battery yeah. wall that uh, Tesla has. I could collect my own energy in my house, sell it back to the grid right. if I have right. too much, right. right? I'm charging my electric car. I'm not paying for gas. So different aspects of abundance, I think, are go hand in hand with these future technologies. But the challenge, of course, is making it equitable and fair because we have a very economically uh, dispersed society, you know, Mm -hmm. economically divided. We have the haves and the have nots, and it's very extreme right now. So I think it's going to be a matter of bridging the economic disparities with some new version of work. I love the concept of abundance too, because I think when you can start from abundance, you just, there's just more there. I mean, that's what abundance is. And it allows you to just have freedom in a different way than you can when you're starting from scarcity. What do you think higher education and specifically Ivy Tech should be doing to prepare for the future? My best advice to prepare for the future is invest in our most valuable renewable resource, which is human potential. Right. You know, I'm all about creativity letting people learn to express their ideas, even if they're not, you know, a a liberal arts major or something. I have so many students who are studying technology and they tell me, oh, I'm not creative. I'm not creative. And I just say, you know what? Everyone's creative. We are born creative. We are a productive species, right? We make stuff, we make tools, we make art, we make ideas. So I think that that is my best advice in investing creativity and invest in just sort of picking up on what you said earlier, invest in manipulating the emerging technologies to humanize, right? Right. To bring out the humanity in people. Unfortunately, too many times it tends to dehumanize. You know, facial recognition, for example, is a really scary technology that people aren't really even aware of how ubiquitous it could be. But, you know, our face is becoming a form of identity. Um, You know, it's, it's not humanizing. It's especially Mm -hmm. people don't know about it. So think that that's, that's my advice. Creativity, investing in human potential and recognizing that all of us have something to contribute. That's amazing. So Alexander, we at Ivy Tech, the leaders here get the privilege of working directly with you. But if others want to get in contact with you, how can they do that? You can find me on LinkedIn. Okay. Uh, I have my personal page and also my Partners in Foresight okay. business page. Um, I'm on Twitter, Alexandra okay. Forecast, the number four, Alexandra Forecast. And I have a medium page, uh, academia. You can read all my papers <laughs> and articles. I have some interesting articles out there. And yeah, and just reach out anytime. You can actually email me at foresightpartner at gmail.com. Okay. All right. Excellent. And I will put all of those in our show notes as well. Alexander, thank you so much. It was wonderful to chat with you. And I can't wait to work with you. Thank you, Kara. It was a pleasure and I'm looking forward to the whole package. (laughs) Every episode ends with a call to action. Please follow up with Alexandra if you would like to work with her as a futurist. You can reach her on Twitter at Alexandra for the number four casts. I'll link to her LinkedIn profile as well as that for her company, Partners in Foresight, in the show notes for this episode. I'll also link to her Medium profile. She has some really interesting articles on Medium that you might want to check out. Thanks again for listening to this episode of Our College, Your Voices. I'm your host, Kara Monroe. You can connect with me on Twitter at KNM Tweets. Our producer is Sarah Ferguson. For this special series of episodes, we want to thank our guest producers, Gretchen Keller and Kristen Moreland. You can reach us by email at ourcollegeyourvoices at ivytech.edu. If you're a member of our Ivy Tech faculty and staff, please join our Microsoft Teams listener community. I send out instructions to our entire college community on how to do that every Thursday. Our website is www.ivytech.edu forward slash podcast. You'll find links to show notes and more on that page. Production assistance for this and every episode provided by Becky Campbell and the Ivy Tech Community College Creative Services team. Our podcast concept is by Matthew Pittman. Theme music and post-production services provided by the incredibly talented Jen Eads at the Brassi Broadcasting Company. 
We'll talk to you next time on Our College, Your Voices.